Uh, thank you. Um, in a bit, commit uh, bit commitment scheme is a cryptographic primitive that's used, for example, in zero knowledge proofs and multi party computation. Uh, we have Alice, the verifier, and Bob, the prover. Bob has uh, selected the value of some bit b, and, but he does not wa yet want Alice to know that value. On the other hand, he wants to convince Alice that he can't change his mind about that later on. So he sends a commitment, and um, Alice should not be able to learn the value of b from that commitment. That's called the hiding property of the scheme. And uh, when it's time to reveal the value, he sends an opening. From the commitment and the opening, Alice can compute the value b and also perform some check to see if Bob prepared the commitment honestly. That means uh, if, for example, he commits to zero, then changes his mind and tries to open to one, Alice will detect that and can abort the protocol. That's called the binding property of the bit commitment scheme. Uh, information theoretic security is impossible for bit commitment schemes, and uh, that also holds when the uh, two parties can use quantum communication. So uh, we either have to make computational hardness assumptions or bound the quantum memory that the, prover, uh, that the two parties have. Our one final option that was suggested by Ben Orr, Goldfasser, Killian, and Victorson in 1988 is to uh, split up the prover into uh, multiple entities that can't communicate with each other. Uh, let's see how such a multi-prover scheme might look. Uh, on the top, we have the two provers, and uh, they, both, uh, they both know the value of the bit b that they want to commit to, and they have some shared randomness r, but uh, during the protocol, they can't communicate with each other. Now the protocol works as follows. A select, uh, Alice selects some random message A and sends it to Bob. Bob computes uh, B times A, so just scalar multiplication, and XORs that uh, with this randomness. So that's essentially one-time pad encryption, so Alice can learn nothing about the bit B ahead of time. Uh, to open, Charlie sends the bit B together with the randomness. And then uh, Alice can compute the XOR of both messages, basically decrypting the one-time pad, and then uh, she can check if uh, the outcome is B times A, as it should be. Okay, we saw that the scheme is hiding. And let's see why it's binding. Suppose now we have dishonest provers, still with shared randomness, but they can't communicate. And uh, if Charlie wants to open the commitment to zero, then uh, what he has to do is send the same message as Bob. If he wants to open to one, then he has to send the message from Bob X out with A. But if he can send both of those messages, it follows that he knows A. And, but uh, Alice did not tell him A. Bob can't tell him A. So the only way he can know A is by a very lucky guess. And uh, therefore, the scheme is binding. So now we have a, a bit commitment scheme that is secure based only on the non-communication assumption. Or maybe not, as uh, Crepo, Savai, Sima, and Tab pointed out. Uh, what they pointed out was that uh, this proof assumes the provers only have uh, shared randomness. However, uh, the security of bit commitment schemes depends on the resources that the dishonest provers have. For example, we can consider shared randomness as we did before, also quantum entanglement, or general non-signaling systems, which, is, uh, which are basically only restricted by the non-communication con uh, condition. Uh, so basically, if we want to say that a bit commitment scheme is secure based only on the non-communication assumption, then it has to be secure in that third setting. Uh, what uh, Crepeau et al. showed was that uh, the scheme we just saw is binding against classical adversaries, binding against quantum adversaries, but non-binding uh, against non-signaling adversaries. And also, if we, uh, if we tweak that scheme a little bit, we get one that is binding against classical uh, adversaries, but it already fails in the quantum setting. And furthermore, there is no scheme now known at all that is binding in the non-signaling setting. So uh, what we are asking ourselves is, 
uh, is, uh, is it even possible to have a scheme that is binding in that setting? And uh, we have an impossibility result for the two-prover case. However, surprisingly, a positive result for three provers. Uh, before getting into that, I, I, need to be, uh, I need to define uh, more formally what non-signaling means. So this box here is a bipartite non-signaling system, and uh, it has, on the left and on the right, it has one input and one output. And what the non-signaling condition means is that the input-output behavior on the left is independent of what goes in on the right, and vice versa. Uh, more formally, that means uh, if we take the uh, marginal distribution of the first output variable, then it's independent of the second input variable, and vice versa for, uh, for the other side. However, we, uh, the output variables can, uh, can be correlated in arbitrary, arbitrary ways. So uh, let's uh, see an example of a non-signaling box. Uh, we have some input A, and the output on the left is a uniformly random X. So clearly that's also independent of B. And uh, the output on the right is B times A, X odd with X. So uh, something, X or something uniformly random, so clearly that's independent of A. So the box is non-signaling. However, if we X or the two outputs, we always get B times A. So uh, if you recall, that's exactly the acceptance condition of the scheme we just saw. So if the dishonest provers have, uh, have a box like this, they can always break that scheme. Uh, now what I'd like to show you is our impossibility result for a restricted class of bit commitment schemes, which we call simple schemes. What that means is that uh, the communication works uh, exactly as in the scheme we saw. Alice sends some message A, Bob replies with some message X sub B, that's dependent on the bit he wants to commit to. And uh, to open, Charlie sends the bit B together with Y sub B. Now, since, uh, since, uh, since Charlie does not know A, his message must be distributed independently of A. Uh, and finally, uh, Alice has an acceptance predicate to check if she should accept or reject that commitment. Now, um, we want bit commitment schemes to have the following properties. First, soundness, which just means uh, if everybody's honest, then uh, Alice will accept in the end. The hiding condition, which means that conditioned on any A, X0 and X1 need to be statistically close so, uh, so that Alice can't get much information about B ahead of time. Uh, we say that an, a scheme is perfectly hiding if, uh, if the two variables are distributed identically. Now, uh, we have the binding condition, which is a bit more com uh, complicated. So in the binding game, we now have two provers uh, that, are, that are still non-signaling. Mm. And uh, Alice sends a message A to Bob, but uh, Bob does not yet know at this point uh, what, bit it, uh, what bit the commitment should be open to later on. And then, uh, and then uh, Alice sends the bit B to Charlie and basically tells him, I want you to open the commitment to that bit. And then uh, Charlie has to produce, uh, and then uh, the provers win if Charlie can produce such an opening, and they lose if they can't. Now the provers uh, play according to some non-signaling strategy Q, uh, Q and we write uh, P0 of Q for the probability that they can successfully open to zero, and P1 for the probability that they can successfully open to one. And uh, we say that the scheme is delta binding if those two probabilities sum up to no more than one plus delta. Uh, our first impossibility result is that uh, if a simple bit commitment scheme is perfectly hiding, 
then it also is completely non-binding, which means that the dishonest provers can always win. So uh, to prove this, uh, so, uh, the two boxes up here, uh, up here are the strategies for the honest provers. And uh, the Y has to be always independent of A because of the no communication condition. And uh, now from these two boxes, we construct a strategy for the dishonest provers, which basically just adds a switch that tells the box to output X0, X, uh, X0 and Y0 or X1 and Y1. Uh, if the two provers have this box, then they uh, can clearly perfectly emulate the honest provers, and thus they always win. So the only thing that we need to check is that this is non-signaling. So uh, first on the right, we get the output Y0 or Y1, but in any case, that's distributed independently of A. Uh, and on the left side, we either get output x0 or x1, but uh, what the uh, but by the hiding condition, it follows that uh, x0 and x1 are distributed identically, and uh, so we learn nothing about b, and thus the box is non-signaling. The dishonest provers can use it, and they always win. So a natural follow-up question is, uh, what about non-perfect schemes? Maybe we can weaken the hiding property just a little bit and get a big improvement in the binding property. What might encourage us here is that uh, the proof before crucially relies on the perfectly hiding condition. Because uh, if the scheme is only almost perfectly hiding, then it's also only almost non-signaling. But almost non-signaling is not good enough. However, it turns out that uh, that's not true. So if a scheme is epsilon hiding, then it is at best one minus epsilon binding. So if, uh, if this epsilon is small, then the provers can win almost all of the time. As a tool, we use the following technical lemma, which states, uh, which I'm not going to prove. And uh, it's, uh, it states that if we have two distributions, x0, y0, and x1, y1, so that the marginal distributions x0 and x1 are close to each other, then uh, we can glue them together into, uh, we can glue all four variables together into one big distribution, so that uh, x0, y1 is statistically close to x1, y1. Okay, uh, let's see how to use this. So the two boxes are, again, the strategies of the honest provers. And uh, the, um, uh, the epsilon hiding condition says that x0 and x1 are statistically close. So uh, we apply the gluing lemma and get a distribution of all four variables. And uh, then we build this box as follows. On the left, we always output x0. On the right, we output, uh, we input b and get y0 or y1, depending on b. Uh, let's first check that this is non-signaling. On the right side, it's as before. The y, uh, y0 and y1 are always independent of a. And on the left, we always output uh, x0 anyway. So that's clearly independent of b. And um, now, how does it hold up against, uh, against the bit commitment scheme? First, uh, in the case that uh, the provers have to open to zero, then they always, uh, they always win because, uh, well, the output distribution is x0, y0, which is exactly like that of the honest provers. And in the case that b is one, uh, the output distribution is x0, y1, but that's uh, statistically close to x1, y1. So, uh, the behavior of the dishonest provers is uh, statistically close to the behavior of the honest provers. So uh, Alice has only a small chance to uh, decide if the provers are honest or not. And uh, we also have a res uh, had a result for more general schemes where, the, uh, where both provers communicate in the commitment phase and in the opening phase. 
And uh, we still have the result that uh, perfectly hiding schemes are completely non-binding. And also, uh, the, uh, if they are epsilon hiding, they can at, uh, at best be 1 minus 5 epsilon binding. So we have uh, some loss there. Uh, we can go even further and look at multi-round schemes, where the commitment phase uh, takes uh, multiple rounds of communication. We still have uh, the same result for the perfectly hiding case, but uh, we couldn't find anything for, uh, for epsilon hiding. Uh, and finally, for the uh, positive result I promised, a, a three-prover scheme. It works um, almost exactly like the two-prover scheme, except that, uh, well, we have the third prover here, and uh, he looks like Charlie, and he also has to have the same output as Charlie, and otherwise Alice won't accept. Uh, we claim that this is secure against non-signaling adversaries, and uh, I won't give a full proof now, but the... Uh, the reason is, uh, suppose that we have adversaries that, uh, that can break the scheme and always output the right thing. So uh, what happens if in the, uh, in the binding game we give them uh, different inputs? So uh, Alice sends A to Bob, get X, and gets a message X back. Then she sends uh, 0 to Charlie 1, and uh, he replies with x because he wants to open to zero. And then she's, but instead she sends one to Charlie two, and he sends back x, x or a because he wants to open to one. But uh, now if they do that, they both together somehow must know a. So basically uh, from Bob learning a, uh, Bob learns A, and they, but they somehow also learn A that violates the non-signaling condition. Uh, so to sum up, in the non-signaling case, uh, all perfectly hiding schemes are not binding at all. In the run-around case, that also extends to uh, schemes that are not perfectly hiding. And uh, finally, for the simple schemes, we have a tight bound that can't be improved upon. Uh, and we get uh, security by adding a third prover. The remain, remaining open questions are if it's possible to improve the bound for general schemes and uh, if we can do anything in the uh, multi-round case. Thank you. <laughs>